Hello St Nicholas class and welcome to your final week of year three. Today we're going to read a little bit more of Roald Dahl Boy and learn a bit more about Roald Dahl's childhood and then I've got a task for you to do about your childhood. So sit back, get snug, let's learn a little bit more about what happened to him when he was your age and then we'll have a look at the task together. So if you remember last time he'd gone on his holidays to Norway and going on your holidays was much more complicated. You had to get trains and boats for many days to get to other countries. Whereas now we can get on a plane and be in another country within a couple of hours. So the next chapter we're going to read is called A Visit to the Doctor. I have only one pleasant memory of the summer holidays in Norway. We were in the grandparents' house in Oslo and my mother said to me, we are going to the doctor's this afternoon. He wants to look at your nose and mouth. I think I was eight at the time. What's wrong with my nose and mouth? I asked. Nothing much, mother said, but I think you've got adenoids. What are they? I asked her. Don't worry about it, she said. It's nothing. I held my mother's hand as we walked to the doctor's house. It took us about half an hour. There was a kind of dentist chair in the surgery and I was lifted into it. The doctor had a round mirror strapped to his forehead and he peered up my nose and into my mouth. He then took my mother aside and they held a whispered conversation. I saw my mother looking rather grim, but she nodded. The doctor now put some water to boil in an aluminium mug over a gas fire and into the boiling water he placed a long, thin, shiny steel instrument. I sat there watching the steam coming off the boiling water. I was not in the least apprehensive. I was too young to realise that something out of the ordinary was going to happen. Then a nurse dressed in white came in. She was carrying a red rubber apron and a curved white bowl. She put the apron over the front of my body and tied it around my neck. It was far too big. Then she held the enamel bowl under my chin. The curve of the bowl fitted perfectly against the curve of my chest. The doctor was bending over me. In his hand he held the long shiny steel instrument. He held it right in front of my face and to this day I can still describe it perfectly. It was about the thickness and the length of a pencil and like most pencils it had a lot of sides to it. Towards the end the metal became much thinner and at the very end of the thin bit of the metal there was a tiny blade set at an angle. The blade wasn't more than a centimetre long. Very small, very sharp and very shiny. Open your mouth, the doctor said, speaking Norwegian. I refused. I thought he was going to do something to my teeth and everything anyone had ever done to my teeth had been painful. It won't take two seconds, the doctor said. He spoke gently and I, seduced, and I was seduced by his voice. Like an ass, I opened my mouth. The tiny blade flashed in the bright light and disappeared into my mouth. It went up into the roof of my mouth and the hand that held the blade gave four or five very quick little twists and the next moment, out of my mouth, into the basin, came tumbling a whole mass of flesh and blood. I was too shocked to be outraged to do anything. I just yelped. I was horrified by the huge red lumps that had fallen out of my mouth into the white basin and my first thought was that the doctor had cut the whole of the middle of my head. Those are your adenoids, I heard the doctor saying. I sat there gasping. The roof of my mouth seemed like it was on fire. I grabbed my mother's hand and held onto it tight. I couldn't believe that anyone would do this to me. Stay where you are, the doctor said. You'll be all right in a minute. Blood was still coming out of my mouth and dripping into the basin the nurse was holding. Spit it all out, she said. There's a good boy. You'll be able to breathe much better through your nose after this, the doctor said. The nurse wiped my lips and washed my face with a wet flannel. Then they lifted me out of the chair and stood me on my feet. I felt a bit groggy. We'll get you home, my mother said, taking my hand. Down the stairs we went and onto the street. We started walking. I said walking. The trolley car, no trolley car or taxi. We walked the full half hour journey back to my grandparents' house. And when we arrived at last, I can remember as clearly as anything my grandparents saying, 
Let's sit down in the chair. Let him sit down in the chair for a rest for a while. After all, he's had an operation. Some, someone placed a chair for me beside my grandmother's armchair and I sat down. My grandmother reached over and covered one of my hands in both of hers. That won't be the last time you'll visit the doctors in your life, she said. And with a bit of luck, they won't do too much harm. That was in 1924. The taking out of children's adenoids, and often the tonsils as well, without an anaesthetic was common practice in those days. I wonder though, what would they think if a doctor did that today? Next chapter is called First Day. In September 1925, when I was just nine, I set out for the first great adventure of my life, boarding school. My mother had chosen for me a prep school in the part of England which was as near as it could possibly be to our home in South Wales, and it was called St Peter's. The full postal address was St Peter's School, Western Supermare, Somerset. Western Supermare is a slightly seedy seaside resort with a vast sandy beach and a tremendous long pier. Along the seafront there was a clutter of hotels and boarding houses and about 10,000 little shops selling buckets and spades and sticks of rocks and ice creams. It lies almost directly across the Bristol Channel from Cardiff and on a clear day you can stand at Western Supermare and look across 15 or so miles of water and see the coast of Wales lying pale and milky on the horizon. In those days, the easiest way to travel from Cardiff to Western Supermare was by boat. Those boats were beautiful. They were paddle streamers with gigantic swishing paddle wheels on their flanks. And the wheels made, of, made a terrific noise as they sloshed and churned through the water. On the first day of my first term, I set out by taxi in the afternoon with my mother to catch the paddle streamer from Cardiff docks to Western Supermare. Every piece of clothing I wore was brand new and had my name on it. I wore black shoes, grey woolen stockings with blue turnovers, grey flannel shorts, a grey shirt, a red tie, a grey flannel blazer with the blue school crest on the breast pocket and a grey school cap with the same crest above the peak. Into the taxi that was taking us to the docks went my brand new trunk and my brand new tuck box and both had R. Dahl painted on them in black. A tuck box is a small pine wood trunk which is very strongly made and no boy has ever gone to boarding school in an English prep school without one. It's his own secret storehouse, as secret as a lady's handbag and there is an unwritten rule that no other boy nor teacher, not even the headmaster himself, has the right to pry into the contents of a tuck box. The owner has the key in his pocket. And that is where it stays. At St Peter's, the tuck boxes were ranged shoulder to shoulder all around the four walls of the changing room. And your own tuck box stood directly below the peg which you hung your games clothes. A tuck box, as the name implies, is a box in which you store your tuck. A prep school in those days, a parcel of tuck was sent once a week by anxious mothers on their, to their sons. And an average tuck box would probably contain, almost any time, half a homemade currant cake, a packet of squashed fly biscuits, a couple of orange and apples and a banana, and a pot of strawberry jam or marmite. And a bar of chocolate and some licorice all sorts. Oh, and a tin of Bassett's lemonade powder. An English school in those days was purely a money-making business, owned and operated by the headmaster. It suited him, therefore, to give the boys as little food as possible himself and encourage the parents, in various cunning ways, to feed their offspring by parcel post from home. By all means, my dear Mrs Dahl, do send your boys some little treats now and again, he would say. Perhaps a few oranges and apples once a week. Fruit was very expensive back then, and a nice currant cake, a large currant cake perhaps because small boys have large appetites, do they not? Yes, and as often as you like. More than once a week, if you wish. Of course he'll be getting a plenty of food here. The best there is, but it never tastes quite the same as home cooking, does it? 
I'm sure you wouldn't want him to be the only one who doesn't get a lovely parcel from home every week. As well as tuck, a tuck box would also contain all manners of treasures, such as a magnet, a pocket knife, a compass, a ball of string, a clockwork racing car, half a dozen lead soldiers, a box of tricks, some tiddlywinks, a Mexican jumping bean, a catapult, some foreign stamps, a couple of stink bombs, and I remember one boy called Arkel who drilled an air hole in the lid of his tuck box to keep his pet frog. So off we set, my mother and I, and my trunk, and my tuck box, and we boarded the paddle steamer and went swooshing across the Bristol Channel in a shower of spray. I liked that part of it, but I began to grow apprehensive as I disembarked on the pier at Western Supermare and watched my trunk and tuck box being loaded into an English taxi, which would drive us to St Peter's. I had absolutely no idea what was in store for me. I had never spent a single night away from my large family before. St Peter's was on a hill above a town. It was a long three-storied stone building that looked rather like a private lunatic asylum, and in front of it lay the playing fields, which there with their three football pitches. One third of the building was reserved for the headmaster and his family. The rest of it housed the boys, about 150 of them altogether, if I remember rightly. As we got out of the taxi, I saw the whole driveway with small boys and their parents and their trunks and their tuck boxes. And the man I took to be the headmaster was swimming around amongst them, shaking everybody's hand. I've already told you that all headmasters are giants, and this one was no exception. He advanced upon my mother and shook her by the hand. Then he shook me by the hand, and as he did so, he gave me the kind of flashing grin a shark might give a small fish before he gobbles it up. One of his front teeth, I noticed, was edged all the way round with gold, and his hair was slicked down with so much hair cream that it glistened like butter. Right, he said to me, off you go and report to the matron. And to my mother, he said briskly, goodbye, Mrs. Dahl. I shouldn't linger if I was you. We'll look after him. My mother got the message. She kissed me on the cheek and said goodbye and climbed back into the taxi. The headmaster moved away to another group and I was left standing there beside my brand new trunk and my brand new tuck box and I began to cry. At St Peter's, Sunday mornings, was letter writing time. At nine o'clock, the whole school had to go to their desk and spend an hour writing a letter home to their parents. At 10.15, we put on our caps and coats and formed up outside the school in a long crocodile and marched, in a long crocodile and marched a couple of miles down into Western Supermare for church. And we didn't get back until lunchtime. The church going never became a habit with me. Letter writing did. Here is the very first letter I wrote home from St Peter's. He's popped a picture of it in the book there. From the very first Sunday at St Peter's until the day my mother died, 32 years later, I wrote to her once a week, sometimes more often. Whenever I was away from home, I wrote to her every week from St Peter's. I had to, and every week week from my next school, Repton, and every week from Dar Salaam in South Africa, where I went on my first job after leaving school, and then every week during the war from Kenya and Iraq and Egypt, and then where I was flying for the RAF. My mother, for her part, kept every one of those letters, binding them carefully in neat bundles with green tape. But this was her own secret. She never told me she was doing it. In 1957, when she knew she was dying, I was in hospital in Oxford having a serious operation on my spine and I was unable to write to her. So she had a telephone specially installed beside her bed in order that she might have one last conversation with me. She didn't tell me she was dying, nor did anyone else for that matter, because I was in a fairly serious condition myself at the time. She simply asked me, how I was and hoped I'd get better soon and sent me her love. I had no idea that she would die the next day. 
but she knew all right and she wanted to reach out and speak to me for the last time. When I recovered and went home, I was given this vast collection of letters, all so neatly bounded with green tape, more than 600 of them altogether, dating from 1925 to 1945, each one in its original envelope with the old stamps still on them. I'm awfully lucky to have something like this to refer to in my old age. Letter writing was a serious business at St Peter's. It was as much a lesson as spelling and punctuation as anything else because the headmaster would patrol the classroom all through the session, peering over our shoulders to read what we were writing and to point out our mistakes. But that, I'm quite sure, was not the main reason for his interest. He was there to make sure that nothing horrid was being written about his school. There was no way, therefore, that we could ever complain to our parents about anything during term time. If we thought the food was lousy, or if we hated a certain master, or if we'd been thrashed or something we did not do, we never dared say anything in our letters. In fact, we often went the other way, in order to please that dangerous headmaster, who was leaning over our shoulders and reading what we had written. We would say splendid things about school, and go on about how lovely the masters were. Mind you, the headmaster was a clever fellow. He did not want our parents to think that those letters of ours were censored in any way, and therefore he never allowed us to correct a spelling mistake in the letter itself. If, for example, I had written, last Tuesday night we had a lecture, and he spelt night with a K, as if it was a knight in shining armour, Don't you know how to spell night? Uh, yes, sir. K-N-I-G-H-T. That's the other kind of night, you idiot. What kind, sir? I, I don't understand. The one in the shining armour. The man on the horseback. How do you spell Tuesday night? I, I, I'm not sure, sir. It's N-I-G-H-T, boy. N-I-G-H-T. Stay in and write it out for me 50 times this afternoon. No, no, don't change it in your letter. You don't want to make it messier than it already is. It must go as you wrote it. Thus, the unexpecting parent received this subtle way. The impression was that the letter had never been seen or censored or corrected by anyone. And we'll finish there for today. But the next chapter is called The Matron. So, Roldal mentions in his book that he found letter writing really important and really precious because now he can look back many, many years on and he can reread those letters and not only does it bring him back lots of memories, it reminds him of what happened, what school was like and it gave him a way of being able to write his book. So... What I would like you to do today is I would like you to write a letter and I'd like you to write a letter about starting year three. So now we're coming to the end of it. I want you to look back at your first day of year three. I remember saying goodbye to all of you at the end of year two. And you moved on to year three with Miss Putland and started a brand new year and a brand new key stage. So I want you to do is think about how you felt when you started year three. And imagine you're writing a letter home to tell your parents or your brothers or sisters or your grandparents, whoever you'd like to write the letter to, and tell them all about it. What was school like? What did you get up to in the playground? Was it scary? Did you get upset? Were you excited? And then you've got a letter about your childhood when you were a similar age that maybe one day you can look back on. So... Have a really good think. What was it like at the start of year three? Write a letter to anyone you'd like to and maybe find somewhere safe to keep it that you can find it again in years and years to come. So have fun writing your letters and remembering. Remember, if you remember anything silly or funny, include it because they're the best bits. And I will see you on Thursday.